Welcome to those of you that have joined us for today's webinar on the North Central SARE Professional Development Program grant opportunity that we have. And I am Rob Myers. I am a faculty member at the University of Missouri, but serve as the coordinator for the professional development program. And we'll be walking you through some tips on applying for the SARE grants. We um, have several different grants that we offer through North Central SARE, and uh, each of them has a different deadline. So this is the one that is coming up soonest and happy to be able to go through this with you. And then we'll take some questions afterwards if you have any. So with that, I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, first of all, uh, as we're looking at these grants, these are something that you can uh, get to by looking at um, our website, which is the North Central SARA website. Uh, so you can get to that either through the SARA main homepage, SARA.org, or you can go through NCR SARA's webpage. SARA is a grants and outreach program to advance sustainable innovations in the whole of American agriculture. Uh, so it's a very broad based program. We work with farms and projects of all types and sizes. We do try to emphasize that SARA is a bottom-up grants program, um, certainly science-based, but very practical and problem-solving oriented, and try to be inclusive for diverse audiences. Uh, the grants that we offer are competitive, so the people that apply are competing against other applicants. Normally with our professional development grant program, we fund around a third of the applications, but it varies from year to year what the exact percentage is. One thing to be aware of is that we do have a variety of uh, resources available in terms of background material. That's through our SARA outreach program. Uh, some of these may be helpful to you as references while you're preparing your application or just in general for some of the programs you do. And particularly as you're doing uh, education outreach training for other audiences, these may be helpful. So we have about 20 different books, a similar number of bulletins, and then lots and lots of fact sheets and videos. All these are available for free online. The books, if you order a print copy, there is a nominal charge, but the fact sheets and bulletins are available for free, either to download as a PDF, or you can actually request print copies of all of our bulletins for free, including in volume. So just to talk a bit more about our overall grant program, as I mentioned, we have six different grant programs we offer with the professional development program we're focusing on today being one of them. SARA is organized into four different regions. So you can see the North Central region that we're talking about today is 12 states from the Dakotas down to Kansas, over to Michigan and Ohio. Now, if you are from outside that region, a question that may come up is, can you apply for a grant with North Central SARA, even if you live, for example, in Colorado or Kentucky? Uh, the answer is yes, as long as the proposal is primarily focused on benefiting the North Central Sierra region. Uh, it can be a project that crosses state lines. For example, you could have a project that was covering both North Dakota and Montana, but we would expect the majority of the activity, in other words, at least 51% of the activity would be within the North Central region. So the SARA model is based on the idea that there are three legs to the stool that we're looking at, uh, not only the profitability of agriculture, but protection of the nation's land and water resources, in other words, the environmental uh, aspects of sustainability, and then the, the social or people part of sustainable agriculture is very important as well. So all three of these aspects are important. Now, these projects at $120,000 aren't huge, so we realize that your project may emphasize one of these areas a little more than another. It may be a little more focused on profitability or environmental aspects, or it could certainly be focused on the social sustainability angle. But we definitely like it if you can talk about those three areas of benefits to your project. And on this social sustainability topic, we know that this has been a tough one sometimes for people to address. Uh, really, for any of us that work in this area, it's, it's a bit more challenging maybe than the other aspects. So to that end, uh, Sarah undertook an effort to kind of better define and outline uh, some approaches with social sustainability, and you could find those at this URL. And by the way, these slides will be available. You don't have to write down that whole URL right now. We'll have that available to you later. 
What do we fund? Well, a very wide range of topics. Um, I often tell people you don't have to come in with a very broad sustainable ag proposal. It, most of our proposals are uh, somewhat more narrow than that. You know, they're focused on any of the topics you see here or many others. So it's not unusual to get a proposal that is just on uh, something like high tunnels or specifically on poultry uh, training or maybe on pollinators, just as a few of many examples. And you can see our past projects that have been funded on our website. So getting down to some specifics with the professional development program. These are competitive grants that are up to $120,000. These are aimed at agriculture educators who are training other agriculture educators. So I want to emphasize this point, very important these are not projects to just do education for farmers. Um, if you want to do a project that is just focused on education for farmers, we have some other grant programs dedicated to that. So for example, our research and education program, you can put in an education only proposal specifically targeted to farmers for that program, which is up to 250,000 or our partnerships program, which is a somewhat smaller at $50,000 cap, those can be targeted to just um, education of farmers. But the professional development is really more about training for other ag educators. These are proposals that are due April 6th. You're gonna hear me repeat that deadline a couple times. Uh, we will let you know about your success of your application by August 1st. And then the funds would be available no later than October 1st. Now, I wanted to make you also aware that within the professional development program, we offer more than just these competitive grants. We also support state coordinators in the 12 North Central states. So we have one or two people in each of those states that works as a state coordinator uh, or co-coordinator. And they also have some funds to allocate, but it's a pretty modest pot of funds. They can support travel scholarships or mini grants. Mini grants are typically quite small, like a thousand to $3,000. But if you just wanted to put on one small workshop or a field day, um, you maybe don't need to go for a whole $120,000 proposal. You could talk to your state coordinator about a project in that area. So who can apply for these North Central SARE Professional Development Program grants? The majority of applications come from either colleges or universities or nonprofit organizations. That's by far most of our, our successful grants are from those two types of organizations. However, er, almost every year we do fund another type of group. Uh, sometimes we funded proposals from a soil and water district or somebody with a state or federal agency. Uh, or any other type of organization that is doing sustainable ag training or education programs can apply. Who are these grants targeted to as far as the audience? I mentioned they're not intended to be focused specifically on farmers. Now you can have an event that farmers participate in, but the primary audience should be one of the groups listed here. I would say extension educators is our number one priority based on our federal statute supporting the SARA program. We also have a mandate to do training that includes, when appropriate, Natural Resource Conservation Service or NRCS educators. Um, it's not uncommon to see training programs include some of these other folks, though, soil and water district staff, state agency staff, nonprofit educators, Botech ag teachers or even private sector farm advisors. So your project could target any one of these groups or a cross section of these groups. And it really doesn't matter. Um, you're not gonna get more points or less points if you just have one of these groups versus several of the groups. But the main thing is you spell out who you are targeting. That's very important. Now, again, I wanna emphasize, let's say you're having a week long workshop as a core part of what you're doing. Um, and you're expecting to have 30 people, you can have a few farmers come to that event. Maybe they are speakers, for one thing, uh, but the whole audience should not be farmers. It should be primarily an audience of some of these educators mentioned here. What types of activities can we fund? Well, pretty broad cross-section, but it's all related to professional development, helping people get more skills, expertise, knowledge, abilities in the sustainable ag area. So 
probably the most common thing we find is some type of workshop. They may be called something else, um, but we also fund webinars. Now I would tell you our reviewers usually don't get too excited about a proposal that is nothing but webinars. Of course, during COVID, we, we ended up doing that with distance education. Uh, and you might have a good case for doing a program that is just webinars. Maybe you're trying to reach people all across the North Central region, and, and that might be an argument for doing nothing but webinars. But I would say our reviewers often like to see a couple different strategies. So you might do an in-person workshop complemented by some webinars, or you may do some videos as an alternative to webinars. We have had some projects that have focused heavily on kind of field-based exp experiential education, people going out in the field, maybe getting some chance to do some hands-on activities related to bus tours. Uh, we've occasionally seen projects that either as their primary focus or more often as just a component of the project um, added a special training session to an existing conference. Um, we've had some projects that were kind of more in-depth, like training academies that were kind of a smaller number of people being trained, but for a prolonged period of time, at least a week, sometimes more. And it could be some other type of professional development, but these would just be some examples of the type of format of training that we often see in successful proposals. So the use of the funds, as you can imagine, can certainly be for salaries and benefits. We realize in today's environment that we've got to pay for the people doing this work. So uh, it's not uncommon with the professional development grants that a significant part of the budget goes to salaries and benefits. We can pay for speaker honorariums. And if you're involving farmers as speakers or in other ways in the project as, as resource people, we highly recommend that you provide some type of compensation to that farmer. And an honorarium would be a really common way of doing that. Um, you can have consultants uh, and pay their fees. Certainly you can have some travel and office expenses. Um, we do allow meals and refreshments um, if they're needed for the continuity of the meeting. So for example, let's say you're having an event that's going from 10 until four it would be very appropriate to include some money for lunch, uh, maybe for the afternoon break. But in that case, if the program is ending at four, we don't, uh, based on USDA rules, have the ability to pay for like an evening banquet. If you're gonna do that, then you need to have an educational program that extends into the evening, like an after dinner speaker on an educational topic. We can pay for video development, uh, for facility and AV rental fees. And we don't pay for equipment necessarily like about going out and buying a tractor or we can't pay for capital costs like building a fixed greenhouse. So it really uh, needs to be some of these things I'm outlining there. Okay, let's talk about the sections of the proposal. Um, really these proposals are, it's gonna look like a lot when I go through it, but I'll tell you when you put all this together, it's not a super long proposal. Um, you know, not as long as like a NEFA AFRI proposal that might be 18 pages. These are certainly shorter than that. So like any proposal, we ask that you provide a summary, what you might think of as an abstract for some programs. These are limited to 250 words. Uh, we ask that you identify who that audience is. Is it extension educators or is it NRCS or some other group? That we have a brief description of outcomes. I'll talk more about outcomes in a moment and that you briefly describe your activities. Other components of the proposal in terms of the main narrative, you're gonna have a background section that's what you'd expect, just telling a little bit about why this is an important topic area. Inputs is something a little unique to this particular grant program. What are the people and resources you're gonna use on this project? Who's gonna be helping with the training? And you know that could be a cross section of folks, including farmers helping as trainers. We really want to see specific activities. I would say this is a common reason projects don't get funded is they don't have a good description of the activities. They may say, well, we'd like to have, um, you know, over a three year period, we'd like to do three webinars a year and they're going to be on water quality. And then they don't give us any specifics. So 
if you're going to have a workshop, tell us about how long that workshop's going to last. We don't need to know what day you're going to do it on, but you know, is this going to be something you do in the winter? How how many people are coming to that workshop? What type of content? Give us some specifics on the content. As many specifics as you can provide is going to improve your chances of success with these proposals. Timeline is a specific we're looking for. When do you expect these events to happen? Now, you're not locked into this. We know things can change, but this gives us an idea that you've thought through how all this is going to work. And then a little bit unique to um, these professional development grants, you may be used to competitions where you're asked to have some objectives and some activities in relation to the objectives. We're a little bit more focused around outcomes and outputs. Uh, so outputs are the particular things you're going to be delivering. It could be some educational materials like workbooks, uh, videos, other materials, podcasts, um, who you're going to be partnering with, if that is relevant. And then again, the number of people you expect to train and what type of educators. And the outcomes is a really important part of the proposal. What do you expect to change in the people being trained? So do you expect them to get more knowledge of how to do soil health testing maybe, or that you expect them to be more knowledgeable about uh, food safety rules? And how are they gonna get those skills uh, so that they can eventually, these educators impact farmers? Cause that's the long-term goal of these projects that the educators will get more knowledgeable, more expertise so that they can down the road, deliver that knowledge and information to farmers. We do like to see an evaluation section. If you don't write much about evaluation, you're probably not going to get funded. So try to be specific what steps you're going to take. Um, many times people do a pre and post test, and you can also do a follow up test, you know, maybe six or 12 months after a workshop. Key personnel, we're asking you to describe what role each person's going to play. Now, if they are a key member of the project, we want a two-page CV, not a longer one, just two pages or less. However, we don't need a CV for like a farmer that's an advisor or just a speaker or other speakers. It really should be like maybe the two to four people that are really the, the key individuals on the project that you're providing a CV for. One document we do ask for that you upload as a PDF is a one-page logic model. And uh, this is a template that we have a link to through the National Institute of Food and Ag. You can use a different template for your logic model if you have one you like a little better, but it basically needs to have about these same components, the inputs, activities, outputs, and outcomes. So when we talk about outcomes, uh, if you're not real familiar with that, I would encourage you to read up a little bit more about it before you write your proposal. But we're looking for these changes in knowledge, uh, and that could be a variety of things, including improved skills. And then what actions do we expect those people being trained to take? And how is that going to improve things? Um, is it going to lead to better livestock health? Is it going to lead to more use of cover crops? Is it going to lead to more diversified cropping systems? Could be any number of things, but those outcomes are really more about the impact rather than just saying, well, we're going to you know, have these videos or we're going to have these field days. Okay, budgets. Um, Again, these are limited to 120,000. Now, the good news is SARE caps all of our grants at a 10% indirect. So the money does go a little bit farther than some USDA grants where your institution may be taking a higher level of indirect. Uh, if you are involving farmers in these projects, we strongly recommend that you compensate that farmer in some fashion. That can be an hourly rate or just a straight uh, honorarium, uh, whatever makes sense for your project. And of course, your expenditures should align with the goals and outcomes you have. So again, um, if you're doing a project training people to graft tomatoes, uh, don't expect to be able to just throw a rototiller in the budget and get it funded. You know, you need to, if you're going to ask for something like that, it, it really needs to be a clear part of the training activity. Now, letters, this is a common source of confusion. If you are writing another group in uh, for receiving some funds, we do need a letter from them as a collaborator. If you are having somebody just be a speaker or um, not receiving any compensation other than maybe their travel, 
We don't need a letter from that person that's going to be a speaker. Um, we don't need a letter from somebody that's going to be just an unpaid advisor. And, and we don't want just general letters of support. That's a little different <clears throat> than a lot of other programs out there, in, including our research programs. So this is just something the committee is asked to not get these general letters of support. So only provide a letter if it's a group getting a subcontract on the budget. Now, how do you get to the applications? Well, you can get in there either through our main NCRCR website or through our project management system, projects.sara.org. I'm gonna start with that latter site because it also has some good resources for you, uh, which includes being able to look at past professional development program projects. So you can go look and see what's been funded in recent years. You can read about those projects. You'll see contact information. Maybe there's somebody in your state that's had one of these grants. It'd be great to talk to them to learn a little bit about how they approached it. Uh, so I would definitely spend a little bit of time at, the, at a minimum uh, looking and seeing what other types of projects have been done with professional development grants in the region. Um, you can search by topic. Uh, and you might look at other SARA grants besides just the PDP ones uh, to see what's been done on the topic area you're looking at. So, so definitely take use of this pretty easy to use search tool. Uh, and just, to, just as an example of what the search page looks like, uh, you can search by region, by state, uh, by project type, by time period. I would encourage you to focus on more recent years to get a flavor for what reviewers are prioritizing now. Just one little tip, I find it more helpful to put the keywords into the project reports field that you see there above the red arrow rather than in the title. So let's say you're wanting to look at pollinators. You can search obviously in the, the title box, but you may miss a lot of projects that are including pollinator focus, but just didn't happen to say the word pollinators in the title, pretty obvious. Okay, another thing that's on this page, but you can also find it on our main NCR SARE website is our list of SARE state coordinators. We encourage you to talk to your SARE state coordinator. And again, some states have co-coordinators. Doesn't have to be a long conversation, maybe just touch base with them for 10 or 15 minutes about your project idea and, and see what kind of feedback they can offer you. That may help you refine your proposal to make it more likely to be funded. So you can get into uh, the application system, uh, again, through the project SARA.org or through the NCR SARA webpage. In this case, when you're in the grant management system, you if you've already got an account with North Central SARA, you can just log in uh, at that button, or you can create an account a little farther down. You see a green box for create an account. If you forget your password, no problem. Just like a lot of sites, uh, you can reset your password. So once you start a new proposal, you're going to see some screens like this. Uh, so as you're working through the system, one thing to know is that as you've filled out a particular area successfully, there'll be a green check mark appearing. And that'll only show once you've saved the information you've typed in. So uh, it could be a start date, um, you can see right below that the end date has a red asterisk because that information has not been entered. You're going to have to click on edit the answer to put in that end date. And then you'll get a, after you've saved it, you'll get a, a green checkbox to show you finished that part. We ask that you um, attach uh, some key documents. I showed you a logic model and here's a link that's within the website or the uh, the grant portal to get you to the standard template. But if you wanna use a similar one, that's okay. Again, attach those page CVs of no more than two pages. And again, that's just the main project investigator or co-PIs. You don't need to provide it again, just for speakers and so on. And then I have not yet mentioned that there's an application sign-off sheet. So you'll need to uh, provide that uh, as you uh, work on the system as well, where your uh, organization sign off person um, provides their signature. So some key things to remember um, are that, uh, that we have this deadline of April 6th, that's a 4 p.m. Central time. That's because our IT staff are East Coast and, and they stop work at five. So if there's any technical issues, we wanna be sure to get those resolved. So be sure to get that proposal in by 4 p.m. Central time on April 6th. 
And if you have any questions, uh, here's my uh, contact information. Um, you can also contact our main office uh, to get some additional information. So uh, with that, I am going to uh, turn it over to Marie and we will take any questions that you have. So if you have any questions, there's a few different ways you can share. You can raise your hand and I can unmute you so you can just ask your question. You can also put it in the chat or put it in the Q&A and we will get to your question. So nonprofits are eligible for these grants. Uh, and again, they don't have to be based in the North Central region. You could be with a nonprofit that is national in scope or based outside the region. We just ask that the majority of the work, at least 51%, be focused on uh, one or more parts of the North Central region, the 12 state area. Somebody asked if you're a, a, I'm a postdoc uh, in the US from another country. Uh, yes, we have no restrictions on um, where you're from. Um, we, again, the, just keep in mind that um, the majority of grants go to universities and nonprofits. So if you're doing a postdoc, assume you're affiliated with a university and uh, it can be a university outside the region, but the work would need to be focused on the North Central region. A question about uh, what is a CV? So this is your resume, um, a two-page resume or one-page resume, CV meaning curriculum vitae. Who reviews and scores these applications? On the professional development grants, um, it is usually a uh, mix. Well, so sometimes we, ha we have a, a committee and then we sometimes split it, but I'll just talk about the committee in general. Uh, so the committee uh, has... Uh, at least one or two farmers on it, normally uh, one or two people from a nonprofit organization, a couple of university folks, and then uh, typically we'll have somebody from uh, a state or federal agency. So it's a pretty diverse group. Occasionally we have an agribusiness person on there, depending on the year, but there's always university, nonprofit, and farmers involved in the review. Jasmine asked, where can this recording or these slides be found? After this meeting, um, we'll post them on the professional development grant page on the North Central Region SARE website. Okay, there's a question. If you currently have a SARE PDP project going, are there any limitations to applying for another one at the same time? No. Um, obviously, you'd want it to be a different project, uh, a clearly defined separate activity. Um, the other option is if you're really wanting to build on some work you're already doing in a PDP project, it'd probably be better to wait till that project is wrapping up if you're if it's really kind of building on that earlier one. But if it's a completely different project or activity, uh, yes, you can apply again. There's a few more questions in the Q&A, Rob. Oh, I needed to scroll down. Okay. Let's see. So the second type of grant. So besides the professional development grant, North Central SARE offers five other types of grants. I had mentioned a couple other ones for people interested in doing education-focused projects. And specifically, if you're wanting to do an education program that's targeted solely to farmers, then you would not want to apply for this professional development program. Instead, I would recommend you look at one of two options, either our research and education grants, which the name's a little misleading. The grants can be strictly education. The majority of them include research, but they we have a aspect of that research and education grant program where people apply to just do an education project and those only compete against other education projects. So every year we get 
several proposals for education only projects. Now those don't have to be exclusively farmers, but most of them uh, would be primarily focused on farmer education. We also offer the partnership grants and those can be research or demonstration or education or marketing <laughs> projects. Those have to involve three or more farmers. You could do an education program with a group of farmers in a particular area. Uh, and those are up to 50,000, whereas the research and education are up to 250,000. Both of those grants are due in the fall. Uh, the professional development one again is due April 6th. Okay, um, a question about matching. These None of the SARA grants require any match whatsoever. We don't even ask you if you have a match. So good, good news on that front. Uh, Stephanie's asking, would a project educating staff from economic development groups, such as small business centers or non-ag lenders, uh, on the needs of sustainable ag producers be eligible? Absolutely. We definitely um, would consider any of those groups. The only thing I would say is if you are if you think it's a little unclear how the folks you're working with are going to be educators eventually to farmers, just explain what they do and how they're going to down the road impact farmers. So for example, if they're with a small business development center, you might talk about what role does that staff person play in eventually helping farmers be more sustainable with their activities. Next question was about can we focus on veterans? Uh, uh, yes, we have funded quite a few projects on veterans and they also the questions about respective social benefit enterprise. I'm not sure I know exactly what the intent of that phrase is, but if it's just kind of like, what can veterans bring to the table in terms of societal benefits? Uh, certainly that's of interest in uh, how they, it's got to be connected to sustainable agriculture in some fashion. So if it's about veterans returning to the farm or veterans learning how to be farmers, uh, those would be things of interest. And again, we funded some, some work in that area. Okay, here's a one from the chat side. What's the biggest mistake you see applicants make? I would say the most common thing that shoots down proposals is that people do not provide enough details about their activities. <laughs> so I gave that example earlier that you might just say, well, we're going to do, you know, some workshops on um, goat diseases and uh, yeah, we're going to, we're going to have some farmer speakers and we're going to have some extension educators come and you just don't give any, you don't tell how long the training's gonna be, what's gonna be covered, who the audience is gonna be, how often the training's gonna be happening. So you need those specifics. And then like, what would be the review committee's biggest pet peeve? Well, this is just another common maybe mistake applicants make is they just assume that their topic is a really good fit with sustainable ag, but they don't offer any reasons why they think it fits with sustainable ag. So I I, I hesitate to pick a topic because any topic could be relevant to sustainable ag, but let's let's just say you're going to do something on tree production and you may think, well, this is really sustainable, but it may not be clear how it relates to sustainable food and farming. And um, maybe it's on walnuts. I'm just picking something out of the air here. And what you're really thinking about is how can we get more supply of walnut timber and that that's going to be good for soil carbon. And it could that could fit with farming, but you need to kind of talk about how it's going to add to farmers' profitability how it is going to be good for the environment. So don't take it for granted that your audience knows what is sustainable about your project. You really want to spell that out, even if it seems obvious to you.
Well, Marie, I'm not seeing any more questions coming in. So folks, if you have questions as you're working on your proposal, don't hesitate to uh, reach out to me. And um, again, there'll be some more information online on our website, NCR Sarah, and um, Marie will be posting that recording. Marie, do you know about when that will be posted? Probably by tomorrow, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we thank all of you for being on. I certainly encourage you to pursue an application. Um, and if you just wanted to check and see if your project idea makes sense, drop me a note or give me a call and we'll try to help you think through that. And then again, with specifics, happy to help with that as well. So appreciate you joining us today. Thanks.